For the next 100 days, I'm going to be building a medieval village in Minecraft, transforming this into this. But you can't see that yet. My goals were to, of course, make this village look good, but I also wanted it to be hyper-realistic, so that if it existed in real life, it would function and thrive. Well, I finished this village in 100 days. Watch until the end to find out. As I spawned in, I took in my surroundings. I had a very specific set of goals in mind for this project, but it needed the perfect location first. To keep track of everything, I immediately gave myself a book and quill and began to write stuff down, starting off with a simple to-do list. I also wrote down the style of the town and wrote down the resources said town would provide in terms of trading, such as fishing, mining, farming, felling, forging, etc. All these required a location that could provide all of those resources, as well as receive resources from other towns via trade. This meant that my location needed these things. A natural port with ocean access, massive mountains to mine in, flat grassy meadows for farming, and of course forests for felling. I may be treating this a bit too realistic, but hey, I have 100 days, I can make this work. I want this town to actually function. I grabbed an elytra and fireworks and took to the skies in search of the perfect spot. Pretty soon, I had found the first candidate. It had everything besides two major things for me. The port wasn't connected to the ocean, and the lack of snowy mountains. I kind of wanted this place to look nice. I wrote the location down in the book, along with the pros and cons of the locations, like, like, I, like what I just... Literally what I just said. I decided to keep on looking. I told myself that I would keep looking until I was absolutely sure I had found the right spot. If I had any doubts, I would keep going. My journeys throughout the world took me through nearly every biome imaginable. I traveled thousands of blocks out from spawn searching for that one perfect spot. My journey took me into the night and all the way into day one. Or is it two? Why did the days start at zero? It's so confusing. As day one began... See what I mean by being confusing? I found my second candidate. This place was already much better than the first location. The natural port was huge and of course connected to the ocean. The mountains were beautiful, and the land was relatively easy to build on, and there were massive caves. The only downside was the lack of any forest nearby. But as I said in the book and quill, I could just create that artificially. I began teleporting back and forth between the two candidates to try and decide. And eventually, I decided to just travel a little bit further inland. And I'm very glad that I did. Because at noon on day one, I found a location that knocked the other two candidates completely out of the competition. This place was exactly what I wanted. The port was even bigger than the last location, and it had forests everywhere. I decided that this was the location I would spend the next 99 days building in. I had to plan out the town first, then build later. I began by using frog lights as a marker for where the roads would go. I had a general idea where I wanted most buildings to be already, but I had to make sure they made sense infrastructurally. Is, is that even a word? It is now. As the day continued on, I kept on laying the path where roads would eventually go. I marked out an area where a bridge would cross the port, and I wanted this area over here to be for felling. Don't ask me why, it just made sense, okay? <laughs> Once the northern lights could be seen in the sky, I began building pillars of frog lights to mark out where the essential structures for trade would go, and I continued adjusting the roads and creating the town center all throughout the night. On day two, I began to use a different color of frog light to identify where other businesses would go, along with important buildings like the church and castle. This town was already shaping up to be absolutely massive, and I was hoping I hadn't bit off more than I could chew. As I completed these tasks, I would check mark them off in my book and quill in order to stay organized. The only con of this location was that the land wasn't really flat, so I knew I would have to rely on my terraforming abilities, which aren't the greatest, but this challenge would definitely put them to the test. As day two became night two, um, yeah. I began to create a small base of operations in the sky, just a place to get a good look over my town and keep my important items. I may have gone a bit overboard on the design of this place, but hey, that's what I do. Once again, I used the third type of frog light to mark where the large homes would go. As day three began, I made my base even better by making it look like it was actually flying. Don't ask me why. But finally, most major locations and pathways were laid out, and I was now ready to begin the building itself. As day three continued on, I began clearing out the trees that would be in my way for the road. I planned to start from down here and work my way up, creating the roads first, 
then the structures themselves. My road style will be quite simple. Pathways and oak slabs. I actually do change this road design later, but you know, this is still a pretty good road design. I follow the frog lights creating my path, covering any caves I came across that weren't going to be used for the major mines. I originally accidentally used birch planks somehow and didn't notice for like five minutes, but eventually I did notice and turned them all to oak. I blame shaders for making me colorblind and for also making birch look good somehow. Don't know how it does it. I, I'm kidding, by the way, I love birch. It actually took me much longer to notice the birch than I thought because I was even fixing it as day five began. Here, I used stair blocks to make it look as though parts of the foundation had been cracked and broken off over time, which we'd expect in a medieval village built by hand. I also used block variation to represent age, mixing in some cobblestones into my stone foundations. Every now and then, I would let the stone walls rise much higher than the pathway itself because I planned to build homes on top of them as mentioned before. This process continued throughout day six into day seven where I began to work on the town center. My plan was to create the entire town square at the same Y level and have the main road dip below and run alongside it towards the rest of the town. The details of road buildings aren't all that important, but what's interesting is the way I removed all the dirt to make it level. Instead of spamming left click on creative mode, I enchanted myself a shovel and dug it all in survival mode instead. Once it was all clear, I had to fill in this entire area with dirt, which I knew would take way too long. So, I used a command called slash fill, specifically this one, which would replace all the air blocks in the area I selected with grass blocks. Once that was done, all I had to do was remove the grass blocks that had appeared outside the area using the shovel in survival mode again. This command probably saved me an entire day of placing grass, and I will definitely use it again in the future. Once day 9 came along, I finished the area where the town square would one day be, but I realized I had spent way too long on this area already. So I moved on to another road that would wrap around the cliff side. This one was interesting because the stone foundations were absolutely massive. Originally, I had planned for them to be similar to the cobblestone foundations, being straight up. But since they were way too tall, I actually just turned them into a cliff. They still needed some work and I'll come back to them, but I needed to get to work on the rest of these roads. I headed back to Town Square and continued working on the road that ran alongside it, which led to a massive staircase down into the farming and mining districts. I'm gonna take a little detour here to show you guys the plan of the village. Up here, we're gonna have the farming district. Over here, we're gonna have the tree felling, which will connect to the main village by a bridge. Right here will be where the mines are. Then you have the cliffside road, the giant staircase. We'll have town square right here, a castle here. Maybe up on this mountain over here, we're gonna have a military base down here and in the middle of the port here. We're gonna have a fishing port and a trading port. I might also add a few extra districts later on if I get around to it. Midway through day 11, I began to change the design of the roads to make it look even better, as I mentioned before. Switching from pathways and oak slabs to coarse dirt, rooted dirt, and spruce slabs, along with dripstone rocks along the sides of the path. From then on, all the way until day 14, I continued making these paths. As the sun was about to rise on day 12, I added a grass overhang to the cliffside road to make it a lot more natural and realistic. <laughs> I burned down the forest to make room for my roads. <laughs> uh, um. I continued building the road off towards the gap between the mountains. I had plans for this area that involved the majority of the town's irrigation and farmland, using the water from the melting snow-capped peaks to one day saturate all the farmland below. I really like this path design, and I may go back and redo the original pathways in the style too, but I also need to do this quickly. I'm already 12 days in and I haven't built a single house yet, so I began to work as fast as I could, and from then on until day 14, I continued to build these roads. This is taking way longer than it should. As the day continued on, I began to work on the first major structure, a bridge across the water to connect the tree cutting area to the main town. This bridge is probably one of the best I've ever made in this setting. I absolutely love it. And next up was to build the final road, the road that actually connected the bridge to the forest. And finally, on day 17, all major roads were done. I headed back to my floating base and began to write down the next steps in chronological order to keep myself organized. From this point forward, we were moving on to the next phase, the buildings themselves, and I planned to start off with the farming district, which I actually had a lot of work to do in, in the form of terraforming, so I got to work immediately. I began by creating the river that would saturate the farmland. The lore behind this is that this snowy peak would melt and provide sufficient fresh water to the stream to support the needs of the crops and the people. I don't know if this single mountain alone could do that in real life, but then again, I'm literally flying in the sky right now, so we can ignore that bit of realism. This process of making the river was actually quite hard, as I constantly questioned myself on how to do it, and I made constant changes. But eventually, I decided on a much more narrow stream-like river, which made more sense and looked a lot better. I decorated the sides of the river with coarse dirt and stone slabs to make it look even more natural. 
As day 19 rolled around, I built a cool little bridge across to connect the two roads, and now it was time to actually build the farms. I used the river and some clever water hiding tactics to make arable farmland all over the place, and I continued making these farms all the way until day 21. This place was already looking great in my opinion, just settled between the mountains. But of course, back in those days, all the grain had to be created through less industrial methods. That's what windmills were used for back then, by the way. Instead of generating electricity, they would actually turn a whisk that would grind down the grain, I think, at least. So, up here on this peak, I built the first building. It took me 20 days to get started, but let me tell you, once you start building for real, it's hard to stop, especially in creative mode. The reason it's up here is because I feel like this place would probably get the strongest wins, but maybe not. Just for the record, this is one of the first windmills I've ever built in this game, despite playing for nearly 11 years. Remember how I said that once you start building, it's hard to stop? Well, next thing I knew, I was building the stables. Here, I made use of the slash fill command, but I accidentally did it wrong, and now there's just a giant empty room behind this stone wall. Don't tell anybody it's there, though. It's a secret. Anyways, this place was pretty easy to make, and unlike the windmill, I've made plenty of these in my day, so yeah. I finished it off by adding hay, water cauldrons, and of course the horses themselves. I'd say it turned out pretty good. Next up was a barn to store some of the other crops and barrels and stuff. There wasn't a whole lot of complexity to this build, really. It was just a barn. But I still tried my best to make it look good by perhaps using way too many trapdoors. Mm, no. You literally cannot have too many trapdoors. They're like a cheat code for depth in the build, that's great. And on day 24, I began the construction of the first actual house. After using the slash fill command to clear out a small area, I constructed a lovely little abode. Something to note here is my use of mushroom stem blocks. In my opinion, they are the best medieval style white block in the game. It would be a staple of all my builds in this world. As day 25 began, I finished the house and instantly moved on to another. See how easy this is when you make the roads first? It's great! This house was sort of a peasant home, very small but also in a very beautiful location. Since the house was so small, I finished it in under a day and moved on to a grain silo. The shape of this structure is not my own, but the block choice is, and in my opinion, the block choice is better than the reference. So yeah, I don't know what I'm happy about. I'm dumb. I think. On day 26, I made an effort to search up actual medieval homes and try to recreate them in Minecraft. I did something similar in my 100 days building a modern city video, where I took random images of modern homes and did my best to replicate them to scale and game. And this gave way to one of the cooler houses I've built so far. Though there isn't much challenged yet, to be fair. It didn't look exactly the same as the house I found online, but in my opinion, it looks even better, so screw that image. You know what? I don't need it. Day 27 was partially spent adding little lantern poles around the roads to light it up at night. Finally. And then, I decided to build a couple of custom trees to compensate for all the trees I burned down like a pyromaniac. I have no regrets, by the way. What's interesting, though, is with the last tree built, this section was practically done, and it took me less than a week to do. Maybe there is hope I'll finish before the end. I think the real challenge here is time. I can't die, and I won't lose the world if I do die. So I'm really just pushing myself to build as much as I can. So subscribe if you want more videos like this one. Next up on my list was the mine shaft and the blacksmith, and I had a very fun time with these two. I began by using Tunt to blow up a massive hole in the wall to create room for a minecart track. Next up, I built the entrance itself. Not anything special, it's kind of just a mineshaft, but of course, with everything else in this world, I had to make it realistic, even though I'm flying. So I spent the whole day creating a somewhat elaborate minecart system, so that minecarts would constantly be flowing in and out of the cave, but with a catch. I decided to use the command to summon minecarts with ores in them, so that it looked like empty minecarts were going in, and full minecarts were coming out. So. I used this specific command to summon minecarts with any block I wanted. I originally chose gold blocks, but then I quickly realized that blocks of gold won't be coming out of the mine. It would be the ore. So throughout day 29, I continued to work on the mineshaft, and I have to say, I really, really like this one. The minecarts add a lot of life to the area that otherwise wouldn't have been there. I decorated the outside with crates full of ore that were to be shipped off to the blacksmiths just a few short steps away. And that's the house I made next. For this house, I used the Lego set as a reference. <laughs> yeah. But the house itself turned out really good, especially when taking into account that my reference was literally Lego. That's really hard to say. I finished the house on day 31, and after a few more details like lanterns and eroded land, the mining and forging district was done for now. 
Next up was something I was sort of dreading, the trade port. I planned to have two major ports in this town, like I said, one for trade and one for fishing. The trade port was going to need to be massive, which was kind of the issue. So far, nothing in the village was really all that big, so I had to find the correct scale for this. I began by outlining where the port would go, and originally I made it look absolutely gargantuan in size, but very quickly I realized that I should keep it small to match the rest of the town. It was still huge, but my plans were to have this port look smaller by adding a smaller building on top of this massive stone pedestal. As Day 33 came, I built the actual docks themselves where traveling merchants could dock their vessels and have their product offloaded by a wooden pulley, which I also constructed that day. Er, night. On day 34, I finished the pulley crane thingy and began to construct the buildings that would help tie the size of this place together with the rest of the town. This is meant to be a large warehouse where the traded goods would be gathered and sorted, before being distributed to the rest of the village. This structure took over a day to build, but once it was done, it definitely helped with the sheer size of the port itself. Quite a bit, actually. During the night, I constructed two little vessels of traders, who were currently docked at the town and made it look so the crane was actually picking up the merchant's product. On day 36, I had to, of course, connect this area to the rest of the town, which I did by creating yet another road that slowly serpentined its way down the hill to the port. And by the time it was done, this place looked absolutely magnificent. I was dreading this build, but it turned out just fine. So, after the first port was successful, I began to work on the second one. Like I said, this one would be for fishing, so it would be much smaller than a trading port, but I decided to follow a similar design in its construction. Now, on day 37, I began constructing the docks of the port. For the main building, I built a very similar structure to the one at the trading port, but with nearly every block type changed, so that it wasn't an exact replica. This building would serve as a fish plant of sorts, so it didn't really need to be all that large, which was good because this platform was relatively small still. I took a risk and decided to use blocks I don't use all that often to create the roof, using bricks, granite, and mud brick. This combination of blocks is actually quite nice, and making granite look good is actually not that hard to do if you know what you're doing. The next thing I did was impress myself by building one of the best sailboats I've ever made. I have no idea how I managed to make this thing look so good, but as day 39 began, I finished the boat by connecting it with leads to the main dock. This was done by trapping named rabbits in the spruce pillars and connecting them to leads to give the illusion that ropes were actually holding the boat in place. Next up, this giant frog-like pillar was originally going to be where the current fish plant was located, but I decided instead to build a massive lighthouse here instead. I used this image as my reference and began to build this massive structure. It was by far the tallest thing I had built yet, and I decided to even add the spinning light at the top using redstone lamps and rails. I have no idea if Medieval Lighthouses actually had the spinning lights, or bright lights at all for that matter, but it looked so good, so that's all that mattered to me. From then on until the end of day 41, I converted my original road from pathways and oak slabs to coarse dirt and spruce slabs, as I liked it much more than the path plus oak. And with that, the fishing district was done. That was four districts done in just about two in-game weeks. However, the next few districts would prove to take much longer. For the next three days, I worked on the lumber mill, finally making my way back across the massive wooden bridge to work on this area. This building was really fun to make, as I somehow had the exact amount of room to work with. For the walls, I actually used block variation with diorite, mushroom blocks, and calcite to make a weathered look to the build. Something else that was surprisingly fun to build was the giant forge nearby. I don't actually know why this is here, but it is. So I made it, and it looks cool, alright? Jeez. And after working on weathering the ground around the wood mill, I added log piles in and around the mill to make it look like an actual lumber yard. Although I must admit, hauling trees from all the way down the hill up to the mill is probably a very inefficient process. Oh well. It's better than most things in the medieval days, like constant diseases and witch hunts. I, I think. After a few more details, the lumber mill was done, and next up was the largest project on the list, the town center. Luckily, I had a vision in mind already. I started off by creating the roads that would run through it. It was a large circular road surrounding the town square where a well would be placed in the center. I built said well as the sun set, and once the well was done, I continued on the roads until day 46. As night fell over my world once again, I began with the church for a sense of scale. I began placing blocks using a reference of a massive church, but it quickly turned out to be way too big. So I removed it and went for a smaller one. I started off with stone brick pillars and cobblestone outlines of where flower patches would be, and then over the course of the next two days, I continued constructing this massive church until it was completely done at noon on day 49. During day 49, I built a cross on the inside, but I didn't like how these walls were connecting to the main wall. So I used this command to give myself a tool that could change the block state of any block in the game, the debug stick. I used it to make the wall blocks not actually connect with the wall behind them, and I did this to every wall block except the one at the center, giving it the illusion that it was just hanging there. 
This town square was naturally the site of most foot travel, since this is where the well and churches were. So naturally, there would be many small shops set up around a central ring. These shopping booths were nothing too crazy, but I did my best to make each of them sell something different, being fruits, vegetables, tools, breads, flowers, wines, etc. Also, something to note is that we hit day 50, halfway done already. I'm beginning to wonder if I'll have enough time to finish everything. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. On day 51, I built the first house in the town square, a small yet very cleverly placed house, making it so that the homeowner could add his own shop right in the town center, along with all the other stalls. I would suspect that whoever lives here makes a decent amount of coin. On day 52, I continued the trend of building actual houses here, starting off with the butcher's house. This is probably the simplest house here, but I think the brick roof actually looks really good with this type of structure. Later that night, I began the Fletcher's shop. This house was nowhere near as simple as the butcher's, and on day 53, I finished up the house by adding a small shooting range next to it. Since the Fletcher would sell arrows, would they also sell bows? I don't know. Next to the Fletchery, I created a bakery. This design is one I can't take credit for, unfortunately, but either way, it still looks good. After finishing the bakery, I began to add small decorations all over the empty land, such as wheelbarrows, mini stalls, trolley carts, I think. And beginning on day 55, I ran a small pathway through these mini stalls. I wanted this place to feel lively. I also repeated this process in another quadrant, adding things like a bee nest, among other things. Next up was the Juicy Bovine. In behind the town square, there was another huge open meadow that I had marked out for cattle, ages ago. It was relatively close to the butcher's house, conveniently. Hmm. I began by bringing the road down to where the animals would be, and after I marked out their confinements with fences and walls, I filled a giant cave nearby with water using the same slash fill command as before, which only replaced the air blocks with water. I did this because of two reasons. One, it looks good, so shut up. And two, animals need fresh water, damn it. Nearby, I built a small barn thing to store hay for the cows and sheep that were imprisoned, I mean, given homes here. And as the sun rose on day 58, I was done doing the cattle. Wait, that sounded... Never mind. On day 58, I added one more house to the town square. And finally, after tidying up the land nearby, I declared that the town square was officially done. As the sun rose on day 59, I decided to go on a quick little tour of the town so far, and actually use the pathways I had so far built. They're gonna add some more markets there, I guess. I hear a cow. You smell bad. Now that every major planned district was complete, I began to work on residential houses scattered across the town. I began with the hill between the town square and the cliffside road, terraforming it to become flatter and to have more room for houses, as well as just making it look better altogether. I wasn't done this process until midnight on day 60, where I began running smaller roads throughout this new available land. The plan was to have these houses be generally smaller and more numerous than the larger manors of before. These houses were also going to be less detailed for now, and I plan to come back to them in the future, but for now, the goal was to get as many of them done in a row before I burnt myself out, which happened about five days later. But for now, enjoy me building even more houses until I hate myself. Once I actually did hate myself, I decided not to hate myself anymore and moved on to the castle, which would end up being the largest structure by far in this world. If I'm honest, I haven't even built a castle since my days on Xbox 360, so I really had no idea what I was doing. So I started with an absolutely massive front gate, and when I say massive, I mean way too big to be the main scale of the castle. So after building them on day 67, I decided that they would remain as the front gate, but wouldn't connect to the main walls of the castle itself. Behind the gate, I began placing down the layout of the castle, with things like the throne room, battlements, libraries, armory, and all that stuff in mind. This planning brought me into day 68, where I began building the first tower. Like I said, I have no idea what I'm doing here whatsoever, so I just completely winged it. From then on until early day 71, I continued building up the walls. This castle is still ridiculously huge, even without the monstrous gateway, but this is part of the challenge, trying out medieval styles I'm not particularly familiar with. My forte is modern buildings, not medieval. So on top of this challenge being a race against time, it was also a way for me to practice medieval builds and get good at them, I guess. Day 71 continued with me building the first house inside the walls. This building was going to be an armory on the bottom floor and a library on the second. This building was interesting because I felt comfortable using more rich blocks, if you will, like sandstone and nether brick, two items that this town wouldn't necessarily possess in abundance. Before making the interiors, I wanted to build the second structure, which would house a restaurant slash pub on the first floor, and the throne room on the second, and the king's quarters on the third. The throne room was a much taller build 
than any of the single rooms I had made thus far, but I was pleasantly surprised by how good all of this was beginning to look. My main tactic with builds like this where I don't typically have much experience with them is to follow the basic rules of building I made for myself. If you've seen my video on how to become a better builder in Minecraft, you'll remember a couple of them. The main rules I tried to follow here was to not ever use the exact same type of block for the floor and ceiling. Extra variation makes any build look much better, even if these villagers won't necessarily possess dark oak at all. Maybe they receive it from trading? Who knows. Well, I should know, but I don't, so don't question me. Also, after building the throne room, I kind of realized it's probably the worst possible place for it strategically. One good cannon shot from the ground, and the king is just gone, since there aren't any walls around this part of the castle. But, details. I suppose the intruders would have to climb a huge ass mountain anyway. How high could cannons fire their... their balls? Um... <laughs> On day 75, I built the throne itself using dark prismarine and red carpets, deciding that red would be the color of the king. Which is ironic since technically I'm the king and I'm blue and yellow. Once again, details. As the day continued, I added a small sky bridge between the library and the throne room, tying the two structures together perfectly. I then began designing the library, and I have to say, I think I did a very good job with the interior. I gave the library that cramped yet very open feel with the high roof and narrow aisles. I also began the interior of the armory. Same with the grindstone design I found online while looking at Minecraft armories. I needed inspiration, alright? What you do is you put an armor stand on the half slab, put a leather helmet on it, and then push a block down on top of it using a piston. It gives the illusion of the pedal that grindstones commonly used back in the day. Now the next thing I do is really cool. I found a video on how to make actual vanilla Minecraft weapon racks using command blocks, so I attempted it, and it worked. The tools are hanging from these tripwire hooks. I also added some actual armor to said armory on armor stands so that armor was available for the soldiers who needed armor because armor is now my favorite word. Me and more armor. Um, so that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. Alright then. Next up, I worked on the pub. Admittedly, this is the place I spent the least amount of time with as I kind of wanted to move on to other stuff, but I think I still gave the illusion of a bar. I then used the slash fill command to replace all the grass within the castle with path blocks, and while doing this, I accidentally ruined the floors I had already made and the bottom floors of the buildings, so I had to remake them. I then spent the rest of day 76 and part of day 77 building up the battlements themselves. Once that was done, I made an effort to connect the castle to the rest of the village by first connecting it to the giant ass gate, adding a few bushes here and there to add to the aesthetic. I continued by finally building the road that would connect the castle to the town square itself, and with that, the basic structure of the castle was complete. The next thing I did was make this giant gaping hole next to the castle look better by completely slash filling it with water. On day 78, I began building the interiors of the buildings. Shocker, right? I started that with the fish plant, I think a small conveyor belt thingy. I don't really know how fish plants work, but this one is meant to like disinfect them, I guess? Maybe like cook them a bit? I don't know. It looks cool, all right? It may not be realistic. Even though that was my original goal. Shut up! For the interiors of the small houses, I only added basic necessities besides bathrooms. They're on their own for that. Losers. I worked on the interiors all the way until day 80. And on day 81, I began one more district that would consist of only a few houses. But these houses were going to be the largest in the town. On the other side of the artificial lake, there was a huge flat part of the meadow that I just had to use. Especially now that a massive lake sat right next to it. I began by creating the road that would lead all the way up to the new district. And at sunset, I challenged myself by building a diagonal bridge. I haven't done a lot of diagonal builds in this video, but I'm actually quite good at them. So this wasn't too hard of a task. And on day 82, I continued constructing the road, and I then began to use another tactic from my building video called the box method. It's a way to create foundations without even really thinking about it, and it allows your houses to look more abstract as well. That night, I began to create the first house. For these richer homes, I wanted it to be a theme that they had a stone tower running up the homes, as they would act as spiral staircases. This first house took quite a while to build compared to the others, mainly due to its size. I actually finished it on day 84, and I knew I would have to speed up the building of the next houses if I wanted to finish everything within 100 days. Why did I feel the need to add a new district when I'm not even done the old ones? Ah! As day 84 continued, I began adding cracked stone bricks to some of my builds. Ahem. <clears throat> I also continued on the second house out here. This one was even larger than the first one, and its stone tower was possibly a little too thick, but it still looked good in the end. 
On day 85, I began the third and final house, and if I'm honest with you all here, I definitely rushed this one, but I still managed to make it look good either way. I had more tasks left to do in the main village, and I really wanted to get to them, and with only two weeks left, I knew I had to hurry. On day 87, I decided to give this district a little more of a practical use by building a dam that would hold back the water in the lake, and I made this dam look perhaps a little bit too modern than it needed to be, but I also have massive stone trading ports, so you know, it's not that unheard of. I also like the look of it, so that's all that really matters. On day 88, I finished off the district by adding the stone lanterns I had been dotting around all my completed areas. This area, although rushed, still turned out to be quite nice, if I do say so myself. The next thing I began to do was build a whole bunch of custom trees in the village. Custom trees are one of those things that I've always been pretty good at building. They don't have to be these grand extravagant oaks or whatever. Well, unless you want them to be. But even if you just modify a regular oak tree and add a little bit of slabs and fences here and there, that's all you really need to do to impress the majority of players. So be impressed, dammit! As the sun set, I remembered that the windmill still wasn't even connected to the main village by a road yet. It was the first structure I built, and it was the last structure to be con connected. <laughs> So I spent some time creating a serpentining road that connected the windmill to both the farmland and the cattle. I am so glad I switched road designs from oak and pathway to quartz dirt and spruce. It looks so much better and it takes a lot less time to make. And on day 89, I began the final major project, the fortress. From this point on the mountain, you can literally see everything. So I began with a massive watchtower, and I wasn't lazy with this build. This thing was tall as... um, heck. Yeah. For the next four days, I had to build the fort itself, and I took inspiration from a very unlikely pair of franchises, Pirates of the Caribbean and How to Train Your Dragon. The fortress walls and battlements were inspired by Port Royal, where they have massive stone walls loaded with cannons, and once that was partially built, I created the How to Train Your Dragon contribution, a giant ballista that could fire at a very long range. Astrid Hofferson had one of these in Race to the Edge, so I thought it would be cool to create one here as well. After that, I continued on building up the walls of the fortress and adding makeshift cannons every now and then. Finally, I began to work on the army barracks. The idea was that whoever worked up here probably also lived and trained up here. So barracks were very, very important. And on day 93, I began a massive staircase that would lead all the way up to the fort. And I have to say, it doesn't look all that terrible. I continued this staircase all the way into day 94, and once I finished, I began to add cracked stone bricks across all of the fort, because that was kind of the only way I could add variation and have it still make sense up here. As day 94 came to an end, I moved on back to the castle to finish up the interiors, starting with the armory, which I completely remodeled to have a lower ceiling and different floor. I began sleeping at this point, because I knew that once I was done this, there was very little left that I had to do. On day 95, I continued the interior of the castle, and by interior, I mean anything within the walls, such as merchant shops, storage tarps, and the interior of the watchtowers, which for some reason confused my brain like crazy trying to come up with a good spiral staircase. On day 97, I added even more shops and common areas, and inside one of the corners, I took inspiration from another show I watched called the Dragon Prince, and added a very old tree inside of the castle walls, similar to Catalus. This was also done to add some greenery inside the castle, because up to this point, it was either pathway or dirt. As the night progressed, I added these cool red and white streaks going across the sky to sort of represent festival banners, I don't really know what they're called. And on day 98, I continued the trend of adding cracked stone bricks all the way across the castle. Thank you, Sean. And once that was done, well, I was done. The very last thing I had to do was now populate the town. This also gave me a chance to look at everything I had built over the past 97 days. Populating actually took a very long time. All the way into day 99, which surprised me. This village is much bigger than I thought it was. I finished off by adding NPCs to the castle itself, and I have to say, Seeing villagers wander around my town made me feel very happy. It was like the place had finally come alive. And as day 99 came to a close, I finally signed my book and quill, signifying the end of the 100 days. And I also had fun blowing up my base with TNT minecarts, which could have gone very badly. I took my last few screenshots and finally slept for the first time in the king's bedroom, awaking on day 100. Well, I'd say this challenge was a complete success. I got everything done plus some stuff that wasn't even on the original list. The town makes sense and should be able to operate on its own. It has trading, fishing, felling, mining, farming, an army and a fortress, a castle, districts, infrastructure, security, and of course, it looks amazing. This video took many, many hours to make, so you better be hitting that subscribe button. And also give the video a like to help with the algorithm if you want. It would really help out the channel. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. 
Bye.